All right, y'all, chapter 17. I was way, way early when I got there, so I just sat down on one of those leather couches right near the clock in the lobby and watched the girls. A lot of schools were home for vacation already, and there were about a million girls sitting and standing around waiting for the dates to show up. Girls with their legs crossed, girls with their legs not crossed, girls with terrific legs, girls with lousy legs, girls that look like swell girls, girls that look like they'd be bitches if you knew them. It was a really nice sightseeing if you knew, if you know what I mean. In a way, it was sort of depressing too because you kept wondering what the hell would happen to all of them. And they got out of school and college, I mean. You figure most of them would probably marry dopey guys. Guys that always talk about how many miles they get to a gallon in their goddamn cars. Guys that get sore and childish as hell if you beat them at golf. Or even just some stupid game like ping pong. Guys that are very mean, guys that never read books, guys that are very boring. But I have to be careful about that. I mean about calling certain guys bores. I don't understand boring guys. I really don't. When I was at Alton Hills, I roomed for about two months with this boy, Harris Macklin. He was very intelligent and all, but he was one of the biggest bores I ever met. He had one of these very raspy voices and he never stopped talking practically. He never stopped talking and what was awful was he never said anything you wanted to hear in the first place. But he could do one thing. The son of a bitch could whistle better than anybody ever heard. He made, he'd be making his bed or hanging up stuff in the closet. He was always hanging up stuff in the closet. It drove me crazy. He'd be whistling while he did it. He wasn't talking in this raspy voice. He could even whistle classical stuff. Most of the time he just whistled jazz. He could take something... He, very jazzy, like tin roof blues, and whistle it, to, whistle it so nice and easy right while he was hanging stuff up in his closet that it could kill you. And actually, I never told him I thought he was a terrific whistler. I mean, you don't just go up to somebody and say, you're a terrific whistler, but I roomed with him for about two whole months, even though he bored me till I was half crazy just because he was such a terrific whistler. Um, the best I ever heard. So I don't know about the bores. Maybe you shouldn't feel too sorry if you are, if you seem some swell girl getting married to them. You see some swell girl getting married. They don't hurt anybody, most of them. Maybe they're secretly all terrific whistlers or something. Who the hell knows? Not me. Finally, old Sally started uh, coming up the stairs, and I started down to meet her. She looked terrific. She really did. She had on this black coat and sort of a black beret. She already ever wore a hat, but that beret looked nice. The funny part is I felt like marrying her the minute I saw her. I'm crazy. I didn't even like her much, and yet all of a sudden it felt like I was in love with her and wanted to marry her. I swear to God, I'm crazy, I admit. Holden, she said, it's marvelous to see you. It's been ages. She had one of those... This very loud, embarrassing voices when you met her somewhere. She got away with it because she was so damn good looking, but it always gave me a pain in the ass. So out to see you, I said I meant it. How are you anyway? Absolutely marvelous. Am I late? I told her no, but she was around 10 minutes late, as a matter of fact. I didn't give a damn much, though. All that crap they have in cartoons and Saturday evening posts and all showing up or showing guys on street corners looking sore as hell because their dates are late. That's bunk. If a girl looks swell when she meets you, who gives a damn if she's late? Nobody. We better hurry, I said. The show starts at 2.40. We started going down the stairs to where the taxis are. What are we going to see, she said. I don't know. The Lunts? It's all I could get tickets for. The Lunts? Oh, marvelous. I told her she'd go mad when she heard it was for Lunts. We, we horsed around a little bit in the cab on the way over to the theater. At first, she didn't want to because she had her lipstick on and all, but I was being seductive as hell, and she didn't have any alternative. Twice, when the goddamn cab stopped short in, in traffic, I damn near fell off the seat. Those damn drivers never even look where they're going. I swear they don't. They just... And then just to show you how crazy I am when we were coming out of this big, big clinch, I told her I loved her and all. It was a lie, of course, but the thing is, I meant it when I said it. I'm crazy. I swear to God, I am. Oh, darling, I love you too, she said. Then right in the same damn breath, she said, promise me you'll let your hair grow. Crew cuts are getting corny and your hair so lovely. Lovely, my ass. The show wasn't as bad as some I've seen. It was on this... It was on the crappy side though it was about 500,000 years in the life of this one old couple it starts out when they're going young and all and the girl's parents don't want her to marry the boy but she marries him anyway then they keep getting older and older the husband goes to war and the wife has his brothers and the wife has this brother that's a drunkard i couldn't get very interested i mean i don't care too much what anybody in the family died or anything they were all just a bunch of actors the husband and wife were a pretty nice old couple very witty and all but i couldn't get too interested in them for one thing they kept drinking tea or some goddamn thing all through, through the play Every time he saw them, some brother was showing or shoving some tea in front of them or the wife was pouring it for was pouring it for somebody. And everybody kept coming in and going out all the time. You get dizzy watching people sit down and stand up. Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontaine were the old couple. Lynn Fontaine were the old couple and they were very good, but I didn't like them much. They were different though. I'll say that they didn't act like people and they didn't act like actors. It's hard to explain. They acted more like they knew they were celebrities and all. I mean, they were good, but they were too good. When one, of them, when one of them got finished making a speech, the other one said something very fast right after. It was supposed to be like people really talking and interrupting each other and all. The trouble was it was too much like people talking and interrupting each other. They acted a little bit the way old Ernie down in the village plays the piano. If you do something too good, then after a while, if you don't watch it, you start showing off and then you're not as good anymore. But anyway, they were the only ones in the show, the Lunts, I mean, that looked like they had any real brains. 
have to admit it. At the end of the first act, we went out with all the other jerks for a cigarette. What a deal that was. You never saw so many phonies in all your life. Everybody smoking their ears off and talking about the place so that everybody could hear and know how sharp they were. Some dopey movie actor was standing near us having a cigarette. I don't know his name, but he always plays the part of a guy in a war movie that gets yellow before it's time to go over the top. He was with some gorgeous blonde, and the two of them were trying to be very blase and all. B-L-A-S-E with a little line on top of the E and all, blase and all, like as if he didn't even know people were looking at him, modest as hell, I got a big bang out of it, old Sally didn't talk much, except to rave about the lunts, because she was busy rubbering and being charming, then all of a sudden she saw some jerk she knew on the other side of the lobby, some guy in one of those very dark flannel suits and one of those checkered vests, strictly Ivy League, big deal, he was standing next to the wall, smoking himself to death, and looking bored as hell, old Sally kept saying, I know that boy from somewhere, she always knew somebody, any place we took her, I thought she did. She kept saying that till I bored, till I got bored as hell. And I said to her, "Why don't you go on over and give him a big soul kiss? If you know him, he'll enjoy it." She got sore when I said that. Finally, though, the jerk noticed her and came over and said hello. You should have seen the way they said hello. You'd have thought they hadn't seen each other in 20 years. You'd have thought they'd taken baths in the same bathtub or something when they were little kids. Old buddy ruse. It was nauseating. The funny part was they probably met each other just once at some phony party. Finally, when they were all done slobbering around, old Sally introduced us. His name was George something, I don't even remember, and he went to Andover, big, big deal. You should have seen him when old Sally asked him how he liked to play. He was the kind of a phony that have to give themselves room when they answer somebody's question. He stepped back and stepped right onto the lady's foot behind him. He probably broke every toe in her body. He said the play itself was no masterpiece, but that the Lunts, of course, were absolute angels. Angels, for Christ's sake, angels that killed me. Then he, then he and old Sally started talking about a lot of people they both knew. It was the phoniest conversation you ever heard in your life. They both kept thinking of places as fast as they could. And they think of somebody that lived there and mentioned their name. I was all set to puke when it was time to go sit down again. I really was. And then when the next act was over, they continued their goddamn boring conversation. They kept thinking of more places and more names of people that lived there. The worst part was the jerk had one of those very phony Ivy League voices, one of those very tired, snobby voices. He sounded just like a girl. He didn't hesitate to horn in on my date, the bastard. I even thought for a minute that he was going to get in the goddamn cab with this one. The show was over because he walked about two blocks with us, but he had to meet a bunch of phonies for cocktails. He said, I could see them all sitting around in some bar with their goddamn checkered vests, criticizing shows and books and women in those tired, snobby voices. They kill me, those guys. I sort of hated old Sally by the time we got in the cab after listening to that phony Andover bastard for about 10 hours. I was all set to take her home and all. I really was, but she said, I have a marvel I have a marvelous idea. She was always having a marvelous idea. Listen, she said, what time do you have to be home for dinner? I mean, are you in a terrible hurry? <laughs> do you have to be home any special time? Me? No, no, special time. I said, truer word was never spoken, boy. Why? Let's go ice skating at Radio City. That's the kind of idea she always had. Ice skating at Radio City, you mean right now? Just for an hour or so, don't you want to? If you don't want to. I didn't say I didn't want to. I said, sure, if you want to. Do you mean it? Don't just say if you don't mean it. I mean, I don't give a darn one way or the other. Not much, you didn't. You can rent those darting little skating skirts, old Sally said. Giannette Colts did it last week. That's why she was so hot to go. She wanted to see herself in one of those little skirts and just come down over their butt and all. So we went, and after they gave us our skates, he gave Sally his little blue butt twitcher of a dress to wear. Butt twitcher. She really did look uh, damn good in it, though, I have to admit it. I don't think she didn't know it. She kept walking ahead of me so that I'd see how cute her little ass looked. It didn't look pretty cute, too, have to, or it did look pretty cute, too, I have to admit it. The funny part was, though, we were the worst skaters on the whole goddamn rink. I mean, the worst, and there were some Lulus, too. Old Sally's ankles kept bending till they were practically on the ice. They not only looked stupid as hell, but they probably hurt like hell too, I know. I know mine did. Mine were killing me. We must have looked, we must have looked gorgeous. And what made it worse, there were at least a couple of hundred rubbernecks that didn't have anything better to do than to stand around and watch everybody falling all over themselves. Do you want to get a table inside and have a drink or something? I said to her finally. That's the most marvelous idea you've had all day, she said. She was killing herself. It was brutal. I really felt sorry for her. We took off four goddamn skates and went inside this bar where you can get drinks and watch the skaters and just your stocking feet as soon as we sat down old sally took off her gloves and i gave her a cigarette she wasn't looking too happy the waiter came up and i ordered a coke for her she didn't drink and a scotch and soda for myself but the son of a bitch wouldn't bring me one so i had a coke too and i sort of started lighting matches i do that quite a lot when i'm in a certain mood i sort of let them burn down till i can't hold them anymore and i dropped them in the ashtray it's a marvelous habit and all of a sudden out of the a clear blue sky old sally said look i have to know are you are you or aren't you coming over to help me trim the christmas tree i have to know she was still being snotty on account of her ankles when she was skating
I wrote you I would. You've asked me that about 20 times. Sure I am. I mean, I have to know, she said. She started looking all around the goddamn room. All of a sudden, I quit lighting matches and sort of leaned nearer to her, to her over the table. I had quite a few uh, topics on my mind. Hey, Sally, I said, what? She said she was looking at some girl on the other side of the room. Did you ever get fed up? I said, I mean, did you ever get scared that everything was going to go lousy unless you did something? I mean, do you like school and all that stuff? It's a terrific bore. I mean, do you hate it? I know it was a terrific bore, but do you hate it is what I mean. Well, I don't exactly hate it. You always have to. Well, I hate it. Boy, do I hate it, I said. But it isn't just that, it's everything. I hate living in New York and all taxi cabs and Madison Avenue buses with the drivers and all always yelling at you to get out to get out at the rear door and being introduced to phony guys that call the Lunts Angels and going and going up and down the elevators when you just want to go outside. And guys fitting your pants all the time at Brooks and people always don't shout, please, old Sally said, which was very funny because I wasn't even shouting. Take cars, I said. I said it in this very quiet voice. Take like most people, they're crazy about cars. They worry if they get a little scratch on them and they're always talking about how many miles they, they get to a gallon. <coughs> if they get a brand new car already, they start thinking about trading in for one that's even newer. I don't even like old cars. I mean, they don't even interest me. I'd rather have a goddamn horse. A horse is at least human, for God's sake. A horse you can at least, I don't know what you're even talking about, old Sally said. You jump from one. You know something I said? You're probably the only reason I'm in New York right now or anywhere. If you weren't around, I'd probably be someplace way the hell off in the woods or some goddamn place. You're the only reason I'm around, practically. You're sweet, she said, but you could tell she wanted me to change the damn subject. You ought to, you ought to go to a boys' school sometime. Try it sometime, I said. It's full of phonies, and all you do is study so that you can learn enough to be smart enough to be able to buy a goddamn Cadillac someday, and you have to keep making believe you give a damn if the football team loses, and all you do is talk about girls and liquor and sex all day, and everybody sticks together in these dirty little goddamn cliques. The guys that are on the basketball team stick together the catholics stick together the goddamn in intellectuals stick together the guys that play bridge stick together even the guys that belong to the goddamn book of the month club stick together you try to have a little intelligent now listen old sally said lots of boys get more out of school than that i agree i agree they, they do some of them but that's all i get out of it see that's my point that's exactly my goddamn point i said i don't get hardly anything out of anything i'm in bad shape i'm in lousy shape you certainly are then all of a sudden i got this idea look i said here's my idea how would you like to get the hell out of here? Here's my idea. I know this guy down in Greenwich Village that we can borrow his car for a couple of weeks. He used to go to the same school I did. And he still owes me 10 bucks. What we could do is tomorrow morning, we could drive up to Massachusetts and Vermont and all around there. See, it's beautiful as hell up there. It really is. I was getting excited as hell the more I thought about it. And I sort of reached over and took old Sally's goddamn hand. What a goddamn fool I was. No kidding, I said. I have about 180 bucks in the bank. I can take it out when it opens in the morning. Then I can go down and get this guy's car. No kidding, we'll stay in these cabin camps and stuff like that till the dough runs out. Then, when the dough runs out, I could get a job somewhere. We could live somewhere with a brook and all. And later on, we could get married or something. I could chop all our own wood in the wintertime. And all. honest to God, we could have a terrific time. What do you say? Come on, what do you say? Will you do it with me, please? You can't just do something like that, old Sally said. She sounded sore as hell. What's up, yo? It's still me. All right. Why not? Why the hell not? Stop screaming at me, please, she said, which was crap because I wasn't even screaming at her. Why can't you? Why not? Because you can. That's all in the first place. We're both packed little children. Did you ever stop to think what you do if you didn't get a job when your money ran out? We starved to death. The whole thing's so fantastic. It isn't even... It isn't... <coughs> it isn't fantastic. I get a job. Don't worry about that. You don't have to worry about that. What's the matter? Don't you want to go with me? Say so. If you don't. It isn't that. It isn't that at all, Sally said. I was beginning to hate her in a way. We'll have oodles of time to do the, those things, all those things. I mean, after you go to college and all, if we should get married and all, there all, there will be oodles of marvelous places to go to. You're just, no, there wouldn't be. There wouldn't be oodles of places to go at all. It'll be di entirely different, I said. I was getting depressed as hell again. What, she said? I can't hear you. One minute you scream at me and the next you. I said, no, there wouldn't be marvelous places to go after I went to college and all. Open your ears. It'd be entirely different. We'd have to go d downstairs and elevators with suitcases and stuff we have to phone up everybody and tell them goodbye and send them postcards from hotels and all and i'd be working in some coffee making a lot of dough or working in some office making a lot of dough and riding to work in cabs and madison avenue buses and reading newspapers and playing bridge all the time and going to the movies and seeing a lot of stupid shorts and coming attractions and newsreels newsreels christ almighty there's always a dumb horse race some damn breaking a bottle over a ship 
some dame breaking a bottle over a ship and some chimpanzee riding a goddamn bicycle with pants on. It wouldn't be the same at all. You don't see what I mean at all. Maybe I don't. Maybe you don't either, old Sally said. We both hated each other's guts by that time. You can see there wasn't any sense trying to have an intelligent conversation. I was sorry as how I started it. Come on, let's get out of here, I said. You give me a royal pain in the ass if you want to know the truth. Boy, did, it, did she hit the ceiling when I said that. I know I shouldn't have said it and I probably wouldn't. Wouldn't have ordinarily, but she was depressing the hell out of me. Usually I never say crude things like that to girls. Crude things like that to girls. Boy, did she hit the ceiling. I apologized like a madman, but she wouldn't accept my apology. She was even crying, which scared me a little bit because I was a little afraid she'd go home and tell her father. I called her a pain in the ass. Her father was one of those big silent bastards. And he wasn't too crazy about me anyhow. He once told Sally I was too goddamn nosy. No kidding, I'm sorry. I kept telling her, you're sorry, you're sorry. That's very funny, she said. She was still sort of crying. All of a sudden, I did feel sort of sorry I said it. Come on, I'll take you home. No kidding. I can't go home by myself, thank you. If you think I let you take me home, you're mad. No boy ever said that to me in my entire life. The whole thing was sort of funny in a way, if you thought about it. And all of a sudden, I did something I shouldn't have. I laughed. And I have one of these very loud, stupid laughs. I mean, if I ever sat behind myself in a movie or something, I'd probably lean over and tell myself to please shut up. I made old Sally madder than ever. I stuck around for a while, apologizing, trying to get her to excuse me. But she wouldn't. She kept telling me to go away and leave her alone. So finally, I did it. I went, in I went inside and got my shoes and stuff and left without her. I should have. I shouldn't have, but I was pretty goddamn fed up by that time. If you want to know the truth, I don't even know why I started all that stuff with her. I mean, about going away somewhere to Massachusetts and Vermont and all. I probably wouldn't, wouldn't have taken her even if she'd wanted to go with me. She wouldn't have been anybody to go with. The terrible part, though, is that I meant it when I asked her. That's a terrible part. I swear to God, I'm a madman. That was the end of number 17.